All right, hey everyone, and welcome to BuzzFeed University. So today we are going to take a journey around the world. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. I feel like we're going on a ride to It's a Small World After All in <laughs> Disneyland. <laughs> um, but I'm Jen Wallace, the Director of Partner Education and Development here at BuzzFeed. And BuzzFeed University is designed to inspire and educate with both virtual and live events on the art and science of content creation and social advertising. So today's webcast will be about 30 minutes, and if you hear something that you love, we love to hear from you on Twitter. So tweet at us, at BuzzFeedU. If you have questions for Scott or Keith, today's presenters, please submit them to all panelists in the chat section, and we'll be going through them and certainly be asking questions at the end of the session. Um, additionally, there is a survey at the end that we ask that you fill out just so that we can be best informed of what you want to learn about so that we're putting these on um, and really educating you um, and, and figuring out what's most important. And then also for optimal viewing, please expand your screen to full view and we will be sending a recording to all registrants. So let's get started. All right, so today we'll explore the six lessons we've learned in our editorial newsroom expansion and in working with brands on a global scale. We'll provide best practices and share examples of shareable content that spans beyond the US. Our presenters today are Scott Lamb from the editorial side and Keith Hernandez from our business side. Scott Lamb is the vice president of International for BuzzFeed. Scott is responsible for the international growth and expansion of BuzzFeed starting with the launch of BuzzFeed UK in 2013, and more recently overseeing the start of BuzzFeed's French, Spanish, Portuguese, and Australian editions. Scott joined the company in 2007 as a senior editor, became managing editor in 2009, and was promoted to editorial director in 2012, where he created the web's most engaging and shareable content. If you've ever heard of Disaster Girl, that meme, well, yep, Scott is the originator of that meme. And in 2011, Gizmodo named him one of the internet's most viral people. Pretty cool, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also with us, we have Keith Hernandez, who is the Vice President of International Advertising at BuzzFeed. In this role, he leads revenue efforts and global business expansion for BuzzFeed social advertising. In 2013, he opened up sales operations in Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, and Latin America, while also educating agencies and clients on the business, on the, on the business of the BuzzFeed platform. A seasoned veteran of digital advertising, Keith is passionate about blending creative strategy and custom content to help provide brands with a strong social voice. All right, yeah. so why don't we turn it over to you, Scott? Um, and let's get right. started. Sounds great. Well, very excited to be talking to everyone today about this. We are super excited at BuzzFeed about our international expansion. And kind of the first point that we want to make, and it may at first seem like an obvious one, um, is that the internet is, is universal. Um, BuzzFeed has definitely been a global company in some sense, right since the beginning. Um, even our earliest days, we had readers all across the globe. Um, and right now, we're about at about thirty percent of our traffic is, is international. Um, but sort of outside of BuzzFeed, the thing that we are so so interested in expanding globally is that we've seen this huge shift to a globally connected culture um, in the world, and that's really because of the internet. It used to be that Hollywood would export TVs and movies to, to other countries, and there was sort of a, a very old school approach to how culture would would be transmitted around the world. But these days, um, memes, and we've got some examples here, um, as well as political ideas, can, can spread really quickly because of the internet. Um, and that leads to some fascinating things. Keith, I don't know, uh, do, you have a, do you have a favorite example from, from the ones we have up on the slide? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, without a doubt, I'm still in awe of the amazing power of Doge. Uh, <laughs> who knew Shibu could only, not only inspire a tireless meme, but also be the face of, crypto, of a cryptocurrency and a NASCAR race car? Um, I love this guy, and, and we have Japan to thank for it. Uh, you know, it's one of those things internally. It still uh, packs power when we are, when we share something that has such win. Uh, another one that I that I just have been fascinated by uh, is this dogs wearing pant pantyhose. Uh, it started in China on the social network Weibo. 
Uh, and the first photo garnered over 16,000 comments. Um, and when you see it, you know, you, you realize you don't have to be in China to see the humor in this. This is dogs wearing pantyhose. Uh, in, a, in a few short days of this first post being live, every major internet outlet picked it up, showed slideshows of, of uh, other dogs doing it, and then people across the world were sharing pictures of their dogs in some beautiful pantyhose. Um, I, I think with the World Cup just a few weeks away, uh, it's an exciting time uh, for, for global marketing and for global publishing, because uh, we're about to have one of the most connected events in the entire world, uh, and we can really see people talking across the world to each other. Um, so brands are already thinking about how to connect on a grand, grand scale. What we're gonna talk today about is how can you do that with every program, and how can you do that with every piece that you're doing. But before we dive into the, the brand side, uh, Scott's going to show is going to share more on our publishing me publishing methodology. Scott, you want to take it from here? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, a lot of this is really going to apply to both both publishers and brands. But um, I think the the first point that or the, really the second point that we want to make is thinking about the audience. And for publishers and brands, I think it's really essential to think young, mobile, and social if you're trying to reach a global audience. Uh, we've definitely seen this at BuzzFeed ourselves. Uh, we're at about 130 million uniques a month right now, or, or growing from there. Um, and as I mentioned before, about 30% of that is, is international. 75% um, yeah, really of those so visits are okay. social, so that <laughs> means people are finding us on Facebook or Twitter. Pinterest recently became uh, our number two referral source from, from the social world. So really, we think of social media um, as, as the front page of BuzzFeed. 50% of our visitors are coming to us on a mobile device of some type, so they're reading us on a phone or a, or a tablet, and that number is also growing really rapidly. Um, so it's already half of our readership is in that, is in that mode. And 60% of our readers are ages 18 to 34, so it's definitely a young audience. But it's, it's not just us. Uh, the, the world is increasingly social and mobile. Um, this slide sort of breaks down the total internet, the global internet population um, by region. And it also shows social media users and mobile subscribers around the globe. Um, I think a few key points here to notice, uh, particularly in, in Africa, you'll see that there are more mobile subscribers there than there are in North America. And what we're seeing now is that in Africa and Latin America and, and in Asia, the audience is not just mobile first, but really mobile only. There's a whole generation of people who never subscribed to a newspaper, but now they have a smartphone and a data plan, and they're, they're really interacting and sharing content, consuming media at a high rate, really for the first time. This is a whole new audience for brands and publishers to reach, and it's incredibly exciting. Um, on the editorial side, I think this really, you know, knowing this, uh, this, this is where our audience is, really affects how we approach making content. It needs to be easily shared. Um, one of our sort of key words, if it doesn't work on mobile, it just doesn't work. So I think it's really important to think about uh, what platforms you'll be reaching this young mobile social audience on. And one of the big trends that we've seen recently also is social messaging is on the rise. So the you know, sort of a breakdown of the users of, of the kind of top social messaging apps with um, WhatsApp all the way over there on the right, and then WeChat, Line, Talk, Kick, and Snapchat. Um, these are huge in a number of the new markets that we're going to, particularly in Asia. And you can, um, you can do a lot of different things on these apps. WeChat, for instance, you can, there are payments, and there's a sort of four-square check-in element to it. But we're seeing people sharing a lot of content on these applications as well. And it's really right now is the time to start understanding them and start getting ahead of how to figure out how to reach your, your audience, whether you're a brand or a publisher, um, on all of these different social messaging services. It's also a part of what we've seen in our stats and in the BuzzFeed network of the rise of dark social, which is just basically um, a, a huge percentage of sharing is very difficult to tell exactly where it's coming from. It's people sharing links on IM or sharing them on these social messaging services. Um, the third point that we want to make is I think it's really important for brands and publishers to start thinking more like technology companies as they expand internationally and, and socially. Um, the old model for a media company if they wanted to, to go to a new market was 
to have, uh, you know, it was a very cumbersome and expensive process. Um, you know, a big splashy launch, you have a large team on the ground, really higher up so that you could really cover, uh, you know, a new country or a new region. Um, there was this notion of it being a foreign bureau that was really just reporting the news back home. Um, and because of this also, it was usually just a monolingual approach, just in the, the, the language of the home media company. Um, what we're seeing now, and this is the way that BuzzFeed has been expanding, is, is a newer, more flexible model. And this is, uh, you know, you start with a modest team, a, a small local team. Um, your, your approach is very data-driven, so you're, you really pay attention to what sort of things your readers are sharing and are interested in, and really taking that feedback very seriously. Um, and using translation services, leveraging technology to make the process of reaching an international audience that much easier. So as an example, BuzzFeed has partnered with Duolingo to do crowdsourced translations at scale. Duolingo is a, is a learning language app for a user, but for publishers, they offer a product that allows you to, to translate into a, a number of different languages. So we use them for our French, Spanish, and Portuguese editions, um, and soon we'll be launching it in Berlin and using them for German as well. But it was a really great and cost-effective way for us to leverage some of BuzzFeed's great existing content to reach this new global audience. Um, so here is an example of Duolingo really at its, at its best. This is a post called 27 Surreal Places to Visit Before You Die. Um, the original version got over 8 million views in, in the U.S. and the U.K., and we used Duolingo to translate it into French and Spanish, where it was uh, a hit there as well. Um, I think this post is an, is an interesting example of um, how to choose something that's going to be an international hit. It's an example of how big, beautiful images really appeal globally. But it's also, I think, really important for publishers and brands to think about cultural differences and be really sensitive to them, which brings us to point number four, be authentic to your audience. Um, the, the essential reason that we've hired teams internationally is to make sure that we can make content that really speaks to the local audience. Um, the example here, 37 pictures that prove Australia is the craziest. This is the biggest hit that our Australian team has had. Um, and certainly part of that is it, it appeals to a global audience, but we were really excited to see that it got 600,000 views just in Australia, which for the population there and our current readership, you know, we're fairly new in Australia. We've only been there for three months. It was really great to see. Um, and I think it, it was, uh, you know, it was written by one of our Australian editors and really spoke to a lot of the ways that Australians like to see and, and talk about themselves and share as well. Um, we also wanted to share an example um, from France. This is a, a post that one of our French editors did called 24 Things One Must Never Do in Paris. Um, there's really a, a set of rules apparently that you shouldn't break when you're in, when you're in Paris. Um, but over 200,000 views and a 15 time social list in France. So that's awesome, that's really exciting. But one of the other important things that we've learned as we've expanded internationally is what sort of things not to do. Um, so for instance, in France, we've noticed that people will share um, you know, politically charged things, uh, media criticism, things that are really smart or have a really particular point of view. Uh, but one thing they won't share is cute animals. Um, and in a lot of ways, knowing, knowing your audience and knowing what they like is often knowing things that they don't like. So, you know, the French, for whatever reason, just on social media, aren't going to share cute animals at the same rate. It's really an important thing for us to, for us to learn. Um, so to really to reach a local audience, we've, we've staffed up uh, internationally, and that's a big part of my job and something that we're going to continue to do. But we really have, have tried to toe the line between leveraging technology, doing as much translation as we can, but also really being locally relevant by hiring a, a staff. And you know, we have writers now in Brazil, we have them in Australia, uh, in Paris as well. And our international teams really can give us an advantage. Um, we, you know, to make good local content, you need local experts. Um, it hasn't been all just cute animals for us, definitely. We're also expanding our international uh, foreign reporting, our investigative reporting, our hard news. 
And so we now have a team of, of correspondents distributed across the globe. Um, and they've been focusing on, on conflicts, but also on global issues like women's rights and LGBT rights. Um, it's a, a big international, those are both big international stories this year, and BuzzFeed has really been able to be at the forefront of those. So that was some, some of the, the stuff that we've learned on the editorial side. I'm going to pass it over to, to Keith now to talk a little bit more about the, uh, the lessons we've learned on the, the ad side. Great. Thank you so much, Scott. Uh, yeah, and, you know, as Scott mentioned earlier, we think like technologists. Uh, on the business side, uh, we have deliberately gone into market after the editorial side has been established. They've grown their audience and proved there's an appetite. And we also want to, we learn from their success stories. So one thing that Scott mentioned earlier was to be locally relevant. Um, what we found, especially in the, in the markets like the United Kingdom and Australia, is they, lo they were really interested in, and loved those stories, but they also loved the core of BuzzFeed. They were BuzzFeed fans first, and they really appreciated that new content that was locally relevant, but we wanted to have a globally consistent message and stay true to the BuzzFeed voice. So on the business side, we looked at that and found that we can create great local content. We looked at some of the great stories that the, uh, the, the editorial team came up with. For example, in the UK, there was a story, uh, 19 things you only see in West London. Now that's a story if you grew up in West London, you're currently living there, that's gonna speak to you and that, you know, that's something that you can wear with pride. Put on your Facebook and Twitter profile and say, this is totally me, check this out. Don't you agree with this? Or, you know, some of us here in the United States, we all have friends from Boston. Uh, a post uh, that's based on, on somebody from Boston, uh, you, you, you either know them or you either love them or you hate them, but you want to post it, you want to talk about it. That's a conversation starter. Uh, people are, are absolutely more apt to share a post that speaks to them. We then took this lesson to Australia where, side note, we found that they had some pretty scary children's TV shows in the 90s. Uh, if you have a second to look at the 37 signs, you grew up in Australia in the 90s and you don't know these shows, you might think that horror producers created all these shows for them. Um, but this spoke to the audience, and when we saw the response from the Australian uh, readership, they said, oh man, I can't believe I watched this, I can't believe how twisted these shows actually were. And, the, and it created that great conversation. So our approach to opening the commercial side is to take these lessons from edit, iterate fast, and listen to our audience, so that when the brands are, are ready and we are ready on the business side, we're coming with knowledge and we're able to leverage those assets. Um, so it's still the, the BuzzFeed way, just nuance for that audience, just nuance in a way. So how does this work for brands? I'm gonna share a few different examples. Um, you know, publishers are thinking global, brands should as well. Um, as I talked about earlier, uh, you know, the World Cup is upon us in, in about three or four weeks, and this is, a, this is gonna be the first tr like, absolutely globally connected moment. People on Twitter and Facebook it, and all over the world are gonna be able to communicate with each other, and there's smart brands that are taking advantage of that. You know, Coca-Cola, Budweiser, are doing, Johnson & Johnson are doing things around this event and speaking to an audience of six, seven billion as opposed to the, the regional markets that they're going after. So as publishers are creating local newsrooms, uh, catered to providing both local and global stories to connect on a deeper emotional level, brands should too. Uh, the reality is building a global program is easy with the right partner. Uh, the misconception that language barriers, time zone differences, and working across multiple agencies makes global messaging difficult can easily be overcome with strategic conversation and, under, and a better understanding of what works best. Smart brands realize that it's beneficial to leverage that knowledge, that database, and that expertise to create a holistic strategy across the globe. So let me show you some examples of what we've done so far. Uh, and, and these are great brands that have worked with us. Um, we found, uh, we, we've been working with Starbucks and we found, you know, here in the United States, the pumpkin spice latte is practically a holiday. I know some people, some aficionados, take that day off to prepare themselves for how amazing it is that it's pumpkin spice latte season. Um, they, they get their phone ready to take that selfie. Uh, but in the UK, this is simply not the case. It, it's not a drink uh, that has the same passion points. So to grow interest in market share, Starbucks smartly leveraged their insight that Americans love this drink and that there is a, a decent expat community within, uh, within the London walls. So why not give them great content to share and use them to be the best word of, mouth, word of mouth marketers around. We created multiple posts with them to encourage Brits to try something American, to, to give it a shot, to give you know, bacon a shot, to give uh, American football a shot, and why not pumpkin spice latte as well, uh, to learn from their expat, uh, expat friends and, and have that conversation. 
This gave Starbucks fans the firepower to shift their print, friends' perceptions and let the story speak for itself and, and get that conversation going. So we've been working with brands that have global messages and learn from those and can do, if it's one specific thing, they can do that uh, across the globe. Or if they have regional identities that they want to, they can learn from the insights that they've been doing in the US or in the UK or in Australia and, and really leverage that out. We also have regional partners that are working with us uh, uh, doing local. And again, this speaks to be locally re relevant. Uh, one example of this is Commonwealth Bank in Australia was uh, really looking at the uh, university crowd, the, the people going back to uni uh, after, after their summer break. Uh, so around O week, we created 13 life lessons we all learn at uni. This was, a, again, a post to really identify with the readership and identify with the pains and the struggles that they're going with. Probably the first time that they're thinking about finances on their own. Give them a lighthearted, fun way to think about how they should be saving their money, but also spending it wisely. Should they be buying pizza for everybody in their dorm room? Probably not. It's a good way to make friends, but maybe not a good way to save. Uh, so again, ComBank was able to look at what we did in the United States with other brands and apply it to the knowledge that they have of their Australian audience and create relevant content for them. And then finally, we work with brands on a truly global level. Intel has uh, asked us to, to think about their brand on a, on a global level. How are we able to leverage what we know uh, from the United States to help in their other markets? And as Scott mentioned earlier, we have uh, a partnership with Duolingo where we're able to take our posts and uh, translate them into other languages. So for this example, uh, Intel worked with us on a program uh, called Game Hero. Uh, Game Hero is for their two-in-one ultra book. And the concept behind this was the hero of, of the protagonist of this commercial was sent back in time to uh, have to beat 80s and 90s video game bosses. Uh, this is timeless. If you grew up in the 80s and 90s and played video games, this is something that you didn't have to speak a certain language to understand. You knew who King Koopa was. You knew who Bowser was. You, would, you, you wanted to beat these people. So we're able to create a post, 14 life lessons we learned from classic video games. And through our Duolingo process and through translators, uh, create those exact same posts and target them to BuzzFeed Espanol and BuzzFeed Brazil uh, and, and get them with the same relatable, shareable audience. Um, this is just a, an amazing way to, to connect in with, with the language being in their native uh, spoken language and it's a great way to extend the program outside of the, the US walls. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the markets, what's next for us and, and what we're excited about. Um, you know, the UK, Canada, Australia, we now have both editorial and business uh, sides there running full, fully operational. Uh, for me, on, on the business side, we're, we're most excited about Brazil and Singapore and what we're going to do there, especially with Brazil now having the World Cup so soon and then the Olympics after the growth has just been phenomenal. And Scott, do you want to talk a little, little bit about that growth, what you've seen since opening up the editorial side? Yeah, I mean, um, we were really excited on the editorial side to come to Brazil. I, I feel like it's a, it's a country that very naturally uh, lends itself to, to BuzzFeed-style content. It's a very social country. Um, I think that the sense of humor and the things that they're interested in are very, like, a natural fit for, for a lot of BuzzFeed's editorial point of view. Um, so, we, you know, we've, we've done coverage of Internet culture there. Um, played with played with some of the political conversations going on, but the team is really gearing up right now to uh, you know to cover the World Cup and to help the the larger BuzzFeed editorial team figure out interesting ways to talk about the things that are really happening around the World Cup once it gets once it gets kicked off there. Um, on the editorial side, we're also really excited about uh, about Germany. That's going to be the next place that we launch. We're hiring a team right now in Berlin and. You know, doing the, using the same model that I described earlier, starting with a very small editorial team, being very experimental, um, you know, leveraging Duolingo to do some translation for us. Um, and you know, we're, look, we're excited about all of these markets and looking forward to expanding in all of them. But I'm right now also really amped about, about India. Um, with the elections going on there right now, there's a, there's a lot of news coming out of India. So our, our news team has been covering it a little bit, but we're also excited to bring the, the social content to the Indian market. And we're starting to see um, some BuzzFeed-like sites that have started there in the last six months that are doing really well, which for us is, is interesting to see. Yeah, it really is an amazing time to be working in social and to be doing social publishing. So uh, we're, we're going to 
now start field some questions. But in conclusion, you know, the, the key things we wanted you to take away from our conversation is the internet is universal. You can tap into this universal culture. People are speaking internet as, the, as their native language across the world. Mobile is everything. If you don't do it on mobile, it's not gonna work. Uh, think like a technologist. You can be small, nimble, iterate, and get the point, of, and get the point across and build s smartly. Uh, it doesn't have to be slowly, it's smartly uh, and efficiently. Uh, be authentic to your audience. Make sure that you, you know what they're talking about and, and you're relating to them in a way. And, and finally, be globally consistent, but locally relevant. Write the content for the audience uh, in their local markets, but have a consistent brand message across the board. Um, so we're gonna slide over to um, our new mascot, the Kwaka. Do you want to explain <laughs> this a little bit, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> this, is, uh, this is Australia's number two cutest animal, I think, after the koala. <laughs> but it's been a big part of our, our editorial strategy in Australia so far. It's really raising the profile of the adorable Kwaka. Yeah, absolutely. So, so that is the, the inquisitive face. We're asking all, everyone online, if you have a few questions, uh, please type them in and we'll, we'll answer a few here. All right. Well, we definitely have a few questions, so let's get started with that. And thank you both, Scott and Keith, for a great discussion. Uh, so let's keep it going. So this one for Scott, what percentage of translated content do you use versus original? So the machine power versus, you know, the, the human power. And, and do you think that's going to change over time? Yeah, we, we see that as kind of a constantly shifting metric. It's easy to begin um, in any of these foreign language markets. We, we typically start off with a very high volume of, of translation. So, you know, out of the gate, it's sort of 90% because we start this with one editor. Um, I think in, in the long run, though, we'd like to shift the, the balance towards original content. Um, I think keep the same absolute number of translated posts. Um, but have a much higher percentage of original content. So it really it's a, it's a nice model for us that lets us sort of smoothly, as we staff up, transition that from you know being 80% translation and 20% totally original to being 80% original and 20% in translation. Awesome. Okay, great. Um, and then on the branded side, we have a question. So Keith, how can global brands actively learn from and leverage what they've done in other markets to really build a more cohesive marketing strategy? Yeah, that, cool. That's a good question. Um, you know, the, the best way to, to work uh, with us is lever leverage the people that you're already working with. If you're in the United States and, and you have somebody that you're, you're currently having a program with, uh, your, your, your rep there, ask that person for some data on what's happening in Canada and Australia uh, and what else is going on there. Uh, the best way is just to have an open communication. Share with us more uh, rather, rather than less and, and let us learn from that. Uh, I think one of the, the biggest eye-opening things that I've seen is that there's teams out there uh, that are thinking strategically. They might not necessarily buy locally, uh, but they're thinking strategically on a global level. And if we can, and if we can assist with more data, points around what BuzzFeed's doing, more learnings across the globe, we're happy to do that. Just start, just start and open up that conversation with your particular sales rep. Okay. More questions, lots of questions. Okay, so uh, Scott, will BuzzFeed expand into news and reporting internationally the same way it has in the U.S.? Yeah, I, I think it, it, we, we will. I mean, we, in, a, in a way, we already have. Um, we do have this international team that's, that's sort of covering the globe for us, and mostly, you know, right now in English. Um, but our plan as we go into new markets is to start initially with a team focused on, on social shareable content, on fun stuff like lists and quizzes, and have them really play with the culture. <clears throat> and, then, and then figure out how we want to expand into doing hard news and reporting. And I think it's going to vary um, country by country, depending on sort of the local needs and the local interest in news. But we want to we want to have the the social team there first to really explore the the geography and and how people and where people are sharing things, and that sort of will will dictate um, how we how we expand into news. But the plan, I think, you know, is going to vary country by country. But overall, I think we we would like to then move sort of into that new market with news. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. And, um, and then for Keith, 
on the branded side. So how do brands value international audience versus stateside audience? Um, the, wow. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it varies wildly. Uh, and, it, and, it, and it's something funny to consider is that brands like Unilever and Nestle and Volkswagen are actually not stateside brands. They're, you know, respectively in the United Kingdom, Switzerland, and Germany. Uh, so, and L'Oreal is one that's really interesting as well, that they're in France. Uh, a lot of times the majority of their budget and their investment is outside of the US. So they're looking at it holistically. But again, that, that matters, it, it really comes down to a case by case uh, with the with the brand in question, uh, which is why I shared three different ways to work. You can you can create universal content that reaches the wide audience, and you think about what Coca Cola is going to be doing with the World Cup. That's exactly and Nike's doing with the World Cup. They're looking for the biggest audience of uh, soccer fans out there with that content. Where there's other brands that okay, you know, like a autos company is going to have different regional local setups where that their their audience is a little bit different, and they're going to think about it that. Uh, a different way there. Uh, so, you know, it really does depend on the, on what they're going after and what they have. Uh, but what I've seen in the conversations that I've had is more and more brands are thinking globally and how they can attach what they're currently doing that's working well, whatever market that is in. Uh, I actually saw something where in, Su in, in Russia, Subaru's advertising is doing extremely well. So now Subaru is thinking about bringing that advertising over to the United States. And that's the best way to do it, is not think of it stateside versus global, think of it as, well, what's working at, uh, anywhere and how can we leverage that to bring it to, to, to all of the different particular markets? Great. All right. So we have time for one more question. And Scott, I'm going to put you on the hot seat. Mm -hmm. What do you think of other international strategies like CNN, IBT, Huffington Post, et cetera? Um, well, ours is obviously better. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. It's been really interesting to see um, the different models. I mean, ours is so is so technology driven and so data driven, um, and we you know we really do like this experimental model. Um, the Huffington Post has gone in in a, a slightly more traditional way, typically with a large um, upfront team. They do partnerships um, with with a local media partner. Um, and you know, for for them and for the CNN and for IBT, they have different business reasons that they that they want to they want to do that. And I think that, that sort of like the rest of the web, there are multiple strategies and approaches that work sort of based on needs. Um, so it's been interesting to see you know how quickly, for instance, Huffington Post has been able to expand. They really rolled out very quickly in a large number of, of markets, and you know I know they have a number of others planned for this year. Um, so, I, you know, I, it's interesting. It's also, for us, really clear kind of which direction we want to go. And I think, you know, for the foreseeable future, for the, the next couple markets that we go to, I think we'll stick with, uh, with our plan. But we are watching, um, you know, all those companies very closely. And it's, it's an exciting time. It's an exciting time to see um, not only them, but the, the Guardian expanding internationally. There's a lot of interest in figuring out how to expand whatever your model is into, into new markets. Um, so, yeah. All right. Well, thank you all for tuning in. Thank you again, Scott and Keith. And we will have a recording for all of you um, likely tomorrow. So stay tuned for that. And keep in touch with us on Twitter at BuzzFeedU.